we still have to be in the Middle East, and we're seeing that yet again. The U.S. trying to leave the Middle East is a little bit like Michael Corleone trying to leave the mafia. You cannot do it. You just keep getting sucked back in. Hello, I'm Ed D'Agostino. Welcome to Global Macro Update. The world is facing another serious conflict, and geopolitical tensions are running high. This week, I speak with General David Petraeus about Israel, Ukraine, China, and more. Many of you who watch this channel are investors, and for us, General Petraeus' geopolitical perspective is unrivaled. He retired from the U.S. Army as a four-star general, then he became director of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, and today he's a partner at KKR, one of the world's largest investment firms. He's the co-author of an important new book called Conflict, and the timing of this book couldn't be better. He and Andrew Roberts take readers through how the governments of many of today's political hotspots were formed, how conflict has evolved since World War II, and what the future of conflict could look like. You'll find a link to learn more about General Petraeus' new book in the description below. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now let's get on with our timely conversation with General David Petraeus. General, thank you for joining me. Because of your unique background, I want to ex share with you some things that some financial executives have said recently about the geopolitical landscape. Jamie Dimon recently came out saying he thinks that today is probably the most dangerous time in American history for the last several decades. Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater, writing on LinkedIn, a post, another step toward international war, writing about how he fears that other countries are going to get involved in what's happening in Israel and you add that to what's happening in Ukraine, and he actually comes out and says he thinks the odds of a potential World War III have gone up significantly, which is pretty sobering coming from a guy of the stature of Ray Dalio. Can you give me your thoughts on the geopolitical landscape that we're facing right now? Sure. Um, and again, that's what I do at KKR. Of course, one of the largest uh, investment firms in the world was brought on 10 years ago to establish the KKR Global Institute uh, made a partner along the way as well uh, during a period when we've had enormous growth from 83 billion under management to over 520 billion, uh, now owning about 120 companies around the world with minority investments and another hundred. And the geopolitical component of the diligence process has continued to grow throughout that decade. Uh, to respond, I, I know Jamie and, and I know uh, Ray Dalio very well. Uh, I have enormous respect for each of them. Um, I'm not sure about the risk of World War III. That's obviously very debatable. We can talk about the relationship between the U.S. and the West and, and China, which is what that would uh, presumably refer to. Uh, there's no question about the risk. We do have some agency there, though, that I can discuss uh, later in, when it comes to ensuring that deterrence is very solid. But in a general way, I think it's accurate to describe, and in line with what both of them said, that we face the greatest number and greatest complexity of challenges uh, in any time, arguably since the end of World War II, not just since the end of the Cold War, although obviously there was a nuclear component to that uh, that was very, very substantial. Um, so we, as a country, I believe, do need to provide uh, leadership for much of the Western world, at the very least, ideally for the entire world, um, and if you think of that metaphorically, we're the guy in the circus who, together with our allies and partners, have to keep a whole bunch of plates spinning. Uh, the biggest of those plates, clearly bigger than all the others, is the plate that represents the U.S. and Western relationship with China. Uh, but there's also uh, a plate for Russia, needless to say, the challenges that it poses uh, beyond Ukraine, but also very much in Ukraine. There's the North Korea plate. Uh, needless to say, there's an Iran plate and a plate for Iran's proxies, which, of course, include uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, and then Shia militia in, in Iraq and a variety of other places in the Gulf. And, and they actually have other uh, discrete plates as well, their nuclear program, uh, their missile program, and so on. Uh, there are plates that represent still the Islamist extremist organizations around the world that we've learned the hard way. We have to keep an eye and pressure on because if you don't 
as with the case of the Islamic State after we pulled our final combat troops out of Iraq in late 2011 and after the Prime Minister undid so much of what we'd achieved together during the surge in the subsequent three years. If you take your eye off the Islamic State, they can reconstitute. By the way, there are some lessons there for the situation uh, with respect to Hamas and, and Gaza that we can get to later as well. Then there are plates that represent various uh, nation state um, non and non-state actors, including Islamist extremists and uh, and criminals uh, in cyberspace, uh, all of the different challenges that we face there. There are issues with domestic populism in a number of countries, including in some of our NATO allies. And of course, we have some of those issues uh, here at home when you look at the hyper-partisanship uh, that characterizes much of what goes on in Capitol Hill. So the number of challenges that is out there uh, is really enormous. Uh, and I should add to that, really, the manifestations of global warming, the much greater frequency of and uh, severity of uh, weather events, hurricanes, uh, flooding, uh, wildfires, and so forth that we have seen uh, as well. So when you look at that, uh, and then and add probably as a result of that also, that latter uh, category is uh, substantial human migration. Uh, we are obviously uh, challenged by that very considerably uh, as you look what goes on largely across our southern border, but through other means as well. But so are our European allies with the challenges that they face across the Mediterranean uh, from uh, the east uh, of Europe and, and so on. So it is accurate, again, uh, for Jamie to describe the world the way it is, for Ray to, to describe that uh, as it is. Um, and I think it highlights the reason why geopolitical risk assessment has become an increasingly important component of the investment process. And I'd add one final generalization uh, that also uh, has created this uh, relevance of geopolitical risk, and that is that during that 10-year period since I left government and joined KKR, the world has transformed in a very, very substantial way as a seismic, tectonic uh, change from what might have been described, I think, as uh, a world of benign globalization uh, in which barriers to trade, capital flows, investment were generally going down and globalization, global trade was going up at a very steep uh, angle. Uh, to a world now of renewed great power rivalries, mostly about the rise of the continued rise of China and some of its more uh, activist, aggressive uh, actions and the concerns that have arisen around that that then are manifested by export uh, controls, by executive orders, by uh, increased tariffs, uh, increasing concerns about dual use technology, that which can be used for national security purposes, as well as civilian reasons, um, over concentration of manufacturing and assembly uh, in China, the lesson of COVID, the over dependence uh, on certain uh, aspects there, uh, and, and so on. So that is another feature of this. Uh, and in many respects, um, noting that Russia has had very significant implications uh, for the financial world. There are potential implications beyond just energy markets uh, when it comes to uh, the horrific uh, barbaric attacks by uh, Hamas on innocent Israelis, which will now require, in my view, uh, the destruction of Hamas. And we can talk more about that, too. Uh, and if it goes regional, then the regional and the global implications of that uh, when it comes to investing. So, again, you quoted two uh, very uh, significant uh, observers, very prominent and very thoughtful. Uh, and I certainly agree uh, with their assessments, their characterizations of the world that we face today. You touched on so much there that I but I want to get into. and uh, But I think it just that one answer just so how incredibly complex the geopolitical landscape is right now. So just one last thing on Dalio. Uh, you know, Ray Dalio has been writing and talking a lot the past few years about this concept of historical cycles. 
Yep. And sure. you know, there, there, there's others that that write about Neil Howe is someone that we follow closely. He also uh, talks about cycles. George Freeman from Geopolitical Futures. Mm -hmm. I guess my question for you, as somebody who's been, you know, strategic and in the field, are they inevitable? Because the the the, the projections of the cycles are not exactly rosy. Is it? predetermined or uh, or how can we break a cycle well raised of course he has that classic description of economic cycles um, of tightening and easing and, and so forth and I think that there is a degree of inevitability about that but there's not the same inevitability about for example the Russian um, unprovoked uh, brutal invasion of its neighbor Ukraine that is much more the great man theory uh, of international relations, not great man, great should be in quotations because we're talking about Vladimir Putin, who's very grievance filled, revisionist, revanchist uh, view of history uh, that leads him to the conclusion that Ukraine doesn't have a right to exist, that it rightly should be part of uh, the Russian Federation, the new Russian empire uh, and so forth. Keep in mind that this is an individual who said that the worst day of the last century was that which saw the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, but again, I think were it not for him, you wouldn't have had that uh, invasion and that terrible set of consequences that has flowed for that from that, not just frankly for the Ukrainian people, though they're bearing the brunt of this without question and, and admirably uh, fighting their war of independence. And we should do everything we can to enable them to do that together with our NATO and other Western allies and to hasten the day when Putin realizes that this war is unsustainable uh, and recognizes the incredible irony that he set out to make Russia great again and what he's really done is make NATO great again and that he has done more than any Ukrainian nationalist political figure to make Ukrainian nationalism uh, great as well. So um, again, I do think there there are decisions from uh, leaders, the strategic leaders again of countries that very much, uh, again, are not inevitable. They're not preordained. They're not just, again, cyclical that will follow one after the other inevitably. Uh, they are discrete actions. And of course, you know, there's a huge debate about this. You think of the classic work, Man, the State and War, uh, which looks at the different, um, if you will, the, the reasons for uh, war in particular. Um, you know, are they are they inevitable? Is it inevitable that because of the uh, geopolitical or economic or other competition uh, between, say, the great powers prior to World War One. that this was just inevitable. And again, I, I tend to be a bit more on the uh, the great man view of history, uh, as is, frankly, my co-author uh, for the book Conflict, um, the great British historian and biographer, uh, Andrew Roberts, who's written about a lot of great men, including Churchill, Napoleon, Wellington, uh, and a variety of others, and, and with whom it was a, a real pleasure to to craft this latest book. So let's get into your book a little bit. Everything can be weaponized today. I mean, conf conflict has changed so much. And now we're in a position where uh, it, it's not just kinetic, it's, it's social media yes. is, is, is weaponized, trade, access yep. to food, access to currency, access to banking. When conflict is so broad, what does the future of the U.S. military look like? What what are they responsible for? It's a wonderful question, um, and we think a lot about it uh, at KKR. Uh, we actually have we have a variety of uh, different investment themes, if you will. Um, you know, energy transition, um, the uh, the experience economy, a variety of these different ones. Um, one of these is actually the weaponization of everything. As you just laid out, everything can be weaponized. Uh, and, and you, I think, very uh, concisely described what that is. It goes beyond that, of course. But that actually leads to a theme uh, that's related, which is the security of everything. So first of all, the weaponization of everything, what we see are defense budgets going up very dramatically in some very significant countries. The number three and number four economies in the world, Japan is doubling its defense budget in roughly a five or a bit more uh, than that uh, year period. 
uh, and Germany is is finally, and I say finally because we've been urging Germany for many, many years to meet the NATO standard of 2% of GDP spent on defense, and they were just below 1.5%, a huge source of frustration for administrations of either party uh, yeah. over the years. And I watched um, leaders of either party and their secretaries of defense rail about this uh, at NATO meetings when I was a NATO uh, officer, if you will, as well as a, you know, I had NATO and U.S. hats uh, as a three-star in Iraq, as a four-star in Afghanistan, actually as a one-star in Bosnia as well. Uh, and that frustration uh, was palpable. I mean, President Trump gave voice to that repeatedly. So you see those two countries alone spending vastly more, uh, the, again, two of the top five economies of the world. And then you see this actually with a number of other countries, wherever these threats are uh, more pronounced. You know, you look at the result of what Russia's invasion has prompted in uh, NATO countries. Um, you look at the situation again in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so that's a big theme. Um, but then there's a corresponding theme that everything has to be secured. Uh, there's a big cyber component to this. There are other uh, elements of this. And we get into considerable detail into sp specific sectors and try again to, if you will, operationalize, what does this big idea mean? Um, now, when you look at the US military, what it means is because we're the country that primarily has to lead at least keeping all these different plates spinning. And again, we have allies and partners uniquely. Our adversaries and potential adversaries don't tend to have uh, such substantial allies and partners. So it's a huge advantage for us and we should hold them close and dear, even as we do occasionally encourage them uh, to meet NATO standards and spending on defense. Um, but the U.S. military has to have forces that can do all of that. There still are uh, Islamist extremists, as I noted, that plate. We still need forces that can deal with that, counterterrorism uh, elements. We still are supporting countries that are conducting counterinsurgency operations or regular warfare. So we need to have uh, those particular special forces component of our overall special operations forces. We have uh, essentially advise and assist brigades, security force assistance brigades in the U.S. Army, which is a great uh, uh, initiative, by the way, since uh, in the last, say, five to eight years. And we're sustaining those. Uh, but yes, we then have to shift uh, in focus more substantially to the Indo-Pacific. This is part of the pivot to Asia, a term I never really liked because it implies that we're pivoting away really from the Middle East, which is, of course, where I was the commander. Um, but but also that it, it more accurately should be rebalancing. We still have to be in the Middle East, and we're seeing that yet again. Um, you know, the U.S. trying to leave the Middle East is a little bit like Michael Corleone trying to leave the mafia. You cannot do it. You just keep getting <laughs> sucked uh, back in. So our military has to do it. And by the way, we have to do this in jungles. We have to do it in the frozen tundra of uh, northern parts of NATO, uh, Alaska, all around the world. Uh, we need uniquely uh, the expertise throughout the entire spectrum of conflict, as it's, as it's termed. Everything from actually support to civilian authorities in the United States, for example, during natural disasters, during COVID, uh, our hospitals and other assets and, and just logistical capabilities were employed very substantially. So you have that component all the way through the low end of the spectrum, peacekeeping and, and again, lower components of irregular warfare through counterinsurgency, albeit through host nation port partners, supporting the Iraqi security forces, supporting the Syrian democratic forces and so forth, rather than doing it ourselves because we're, we now have this armada of drones that we can bring to bear to enable them. They do the fighting, we do the advise and assist and enable. Uh, then through conventional warfare and even still, obviously, nuclear deterrence. Um, so again, the U.S. uniquely has to do that. That's why we spend more than the next typically eight, nine, ten countries put together uh, on defense every year. Uh, and we're in the midst of having to transform our forces particularly for the Indo-Pacific theater, to ensure that 
that deterrence is very solid. Keep in mind that deterrence is a function of two factors. It's the potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities on the one hand and your willingness to employ them on the other. So those forces out in the Indo-Pacific, we have to harden their bases, we have to improve their defenses, we have to disperse them, uh, we have to go underground uh, with headquarters and major uh, facilities, and we have to transform in a very simplistic way from a quite small number of large platforms to a massive number of much smaller unmanned systems that increasingly will not just be remotely piloted, but will be algorithmically piloted. And this is not just in the air. This is on the surface of the sea. In fact, we're seeing Ukraine make enormous advances uh, in using uh, surface and subsurface maritime drones uh, to hunt down the Black Sea fleet uh, of the Russian Navy. Uh, they've already forced the, the fleet to displace from Sevastopol, which is how it's pronounced, I've learned in my two trips to Ukraine in the last four months alone, um, to a, a base uh, in Russia proper. And so you see all of these developments, but you also will have them on the ground increasingly. You'll have them in space. You'll have them the equivalent in cyberspace. You really do already have them there. But this is a massive transformation. This is, again, a tectonic shift uh, for our military forces. But as we do that, we still have to have retain the ability to perform all of these other tasks. So we can't concentrate the way we did during the first decade after 9-11, uh, when in fact I was privileged to have five combat commands. We were focusing our, our services by and large, particularly the Army and the Marine Corps, uh, on irregular warfare, on the conduct of counterinsurgency operations, which included, of course, counterterrorism uh, targeted operations as well. This is exceedingly challenging, and yet just one more way uh, in which the challenges that I described earlier are the greatest in number and the greatest in complexity, I would argue, since the end of World War II. And cost. And cost, no question. But but again, as uh, Andrew and I observe, uh, the cost of deterrence uh, generally is more than worth it. The investment in avoiding, preventing, dissuading, deterring conflict uh, is vastly less uh, than the cost uh, if it erupts into conflict. And we have to ensure that what our national security advisor has described as severe competition between the U.S. and the West with China does not erupt uh, into conflict. Every day, the leaders in Beijing need to get up and say, not today. Uh, and that's the job of our military. It's the job of our diplomats, our government officials. It's it, it includes economic, it should include a bigger trade component, one of the missing elements of this comprehensive whole of governments with an S on the end to denote all of our allies and partners together approach to China uh, is that we don't have that component that would have been uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Your comment about themes is really interesting to me because that's exactly how my research team and I approach the investment markets is mm -hmm. we, we build themes uh, because it just helps with uh, giving you a framework for how to view and then project. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. In fact, uh, to come back to the book one more time, Andrew and I wrote the chapters, but it was really, again, delightful to do. He's a quintessential, just brilliant, extraordinary Brit. Um, and there's, there's a very appealing set of qualities about that. Uh, it was just a pleasure to work with him. If, if I can add it, that that does come through in the book. Yes, of course it, it does. It's his. I mean, it's. I, I just want to stress the book is a is it's a sober topic, but yeah. it is a it is it is a pleasure to read. Um, a lot of information, but delivered in a way that is digestible. It's not a, it's not an academic only book. No, I think it's important to, to note it that. that. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of footnotes and I, or a lot of end notes. Actually, I would have preferred footnotes because as an old academic, again, I. In a PhD at Princeton, of course, in a combination of international relations and economics, uh, I'd like them to be able to go right down to the bottom of the page. But, you know, they would have filled half the pages and they said, you just can't do that this way in, in what it is that we're trying to do. Um, but I remember when the publishers asked uh, Andrew uh, and me how we would go about this. Um, first, they said, how did, how did you come up with the idea? It was really his idea. I've worked with him a number of cases uh, in the past, uh, interviewed him at least five times alone at the New York Historical Society on his great book on Churchill. Uh, the George the Third book, I helped him with that. We did an, an event at the British Army Museum where the question for me was, 
could the British have won the American War of Independence? The answer was, of course they could have, if they had a competent civil military counterinsurgency campaign, which they didn't. Um, and then a number of his other books. Um, I'd actually done the Clifton Literary Festival with him twice, interviewed by him, having not written a book. And uh, this time we actually went back and we had written a book. Um, but I remember he was asked by these publishers, how do you intend to go about this? Um, you've never had a co-author before, Andrew. Uh, now, by the way, Lord Roberts, uh, Baron Roberts of Belgravia. Um, and he said, well, you know, I was thinking, he said that um, General Petraeus would write the chapters about the countries he's invaded uh, or served in, uh, plus <laughs> Vietnam, which was the subject of his PhD dissertation, I'll fill in the rest. Uh, and it's really roughly how we did it, although there was an enormous amount of back and forth. We're both uh, pretty uh, assiduous editors uh, of, of each other's work, and I really enjoyed working with him. But the big theme that emerged as we were bringing the book to a close was the importance of themes. It's really about big ideas. And, and actually, bigger than that, it's about strategic leadership. And I, I want to talk about that briefly because the most important task of a strategic leader, this is the individual at the very top. It's the president initially, and then it's the commander uh, of the forces in the field, the commander in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, what have you. Um, and there are four tasks that strategic leaders have to perform. The first is to get the big ideas right. This is the theme. This is the strategy. This, And you have to have a deep understanding of the context in which you're going to be carrying out military operations. By the way, we have not always had that. I felt that we should have understood Iraq better, frankly, uh, when we invaded it, as it turned out. Uh, and obviously, we should have done more thinking about the big ideas for what happens after we topple uh, Saddam's regime, uh, if our assumption that all the rest of the people are going to stick around proves invalid, which it, which it did. Um, so you, again, you've got to craft the big ideas. Uh, George H.W. Bush, who tells a military that was not hugely inclined to rush over to Saudi Arabia when Saddam's army invaded Kuwait. He says, this will not stand in the very first meeting, right up front. And military says, I, we got that. Okay, we understand. And now we will craft a plan. We'll come back to you. Uh, and we're going to tell you how we're going to either force the Iraqis to withdraw uh, because of the forces that we assemble, or we will compel them to do so by uh, actually going in and evicting them from the country, which is, of course, what we ultimately had to do. But once you get the big ideas right, and there's many little ideas as well, we can talk about Bibi Netanyahu's big ideas, by the way, uh, as we as they seem to be emerging. Um, but then you have to communicate the big ideas to you know the breadth and depth of your organization. And we're just, not just talking the military organization or even the country. We're talking everyone who has a stake in the outcome uh, of the military campaign. You have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. That's what we normally think of as leadership. That's the example you provide, the the energy, the inspiration. Uh, it's the driving of the campaign plan by your actions, what's on your battle rhythm, your calendar, which shows which, what is most important, how you spend your time, which should be done in a very careful manner, uh, tweaking it constantly. But again, it's that is how you drive this uh, campaign forward, the metrics that you're using to tell if you're winning or losing, and they have to be very rigorous. Uh, they can't be shaky. They can't be subject to um, inflation as the body count in Vietnam became, and, and it'd be a huge source uh, of challenges to integrity there. Uh, and you've got to attract great people, uh, inspire them, keep them with you, develop them, and allow those that aren't measuring up to, to move on to something else. And then a fourth task that is often overlooked, which is you have to determine how to refine the big ideas so that you can do the process again and again and again. Your battle rhythm should have events on it. Your schedule should have events on it on a recurring basis. I had some that were weekly, some that were monthly, some that were quarterly uh, that require you to re-examine the big ideas and de determine how you uh, need to perform this process uh, again and again and again. So as we looked at these different conflicts, um, we saw that strategic leadership is repeatedly the single biggest determinant of success or failure. Uh, we have cases where that strategic leadership was very impressive. Again, George H.W. Bush and then his 
uh, General Powell in the Pentagon and General Schwarzkopf uh, uh, at U.S. Central Command in the in the Middle East with the uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, ultimately the, the first Gulf War. Um, more mixed cases, uh, brilliant campaign to topple the Taliban and evict the Al Qaeda, although Saddam or uh, Osama bin Laden got away uh, in Afghanistan and then took us nine years to get the inputs right. Uh, because we shifted focus very quickly. Iraq and great campaign to topple uh, Saddam Hussein's government, but inadequate preparation for what followed. The post-conflict plan was was wholly inadequate. Uh, and then we compounded that with seriously bad big ideas, firing the Iraqi military without telling them how we're going to help them provide for their family. Hundreds of thousands who have a stake in the failure of the new government, the new Iraq, rather than in its success, and compounded that by firing the, the bureaucrats, the Ba'ath Party members, everybody had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party at a certain level. Um, yeah, you needed to dispatch Saddam and we were proud in 101st Airborne Division, frankly, to kill his sons when they um, shot at our soldiers, wounded them, uh, killed one of our dogs and so forth in an attempt to detain them. Um, and others, you know, those levels. But when you get down to level four, as it was termed, these are the bureaucrats we needed to run the ministries and, and all the activities at the national and provincial and even district levels. I was very fortunate I got a special dispensation to do reconciliation because the problem was not that you fire them. Um, again, a lot of them needed to be fired, but you needed a reconciliation agreed process to enable hope for those that they could get their jobs back because there is no other job for people uh, in most of those categories. It was all government. There was very, very little private enterprise. Uh, and we didn't, I don't think, grasp that as fully as we should have at the time. So uh, again, another example of those, you see some others where the British and Malaya consummate uh, civil military counterinsurgency campaign, hugely impressive. You see it with um, the British in Oman, uh, another brilliant campaign uh, and so forth. So. All of these cases, uh, what comes through is the critical nature of strategic leadership. And now if you look at Israel uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, who now thankfully has a, a, a national uh, coalition, if you will, with Benny Gantz, in particular my longtime friend, the former IDF, Israeli Defense Force Chief of Staff, former Minister of Defense, joining his coalition, um, then the big idea, it seems to me, if you listen to him, if you listen to uh, the others in uh, his cabinet, some of his more articulate uh, and public ambassadors uh, around the world, you, what you hear seems to me to be the task to the military is to destroy Hamas. That is a doctrinal term which translates into having to destroy the headquarters, the bases, the facilities, where they make their explosives, rockets, missiles, uh, all the other implement uh, of war, um, having to capture or kill uh, the bulk of the leaders, the the terrorist, the fighters, the terrorist fighters of Hamas, and also the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Pidge. Um, and and by the way, thinking of that, these are the Islamic State type uh, terrorists. Um, and yet having to do this in a very densely populated 140 square miles, so it's a good bit smaller than New York, uh, but 2.3 million people, many cases with high rises and nowhere for those people to go. They can't leave the, the, uh, that territory. Um, they can't go to Egypt and certainly obviously can't seek refuge in Israel. Um, so, and the damage is going to be enormous. Uh, the Israelis know that they have to fight in accordance with the Geneva Convention. That's what democracies do. They actually have a term for this, purity of arms. <laughs> they will adhere to that. But again, the, the context in which they're going to do this is so fiendishly, diabolically difficult that inevitably there is going to be significant loss of civilian life, uh, significant loss of Israeli soldiers, obviously significant loss uh, of the Hamas terrorists, but noting that these terrorists wear civilian clothes and they can drop their weapon or hide their weapon. And by the way, they put their headquarters underneath hospitals, uh, store weapons in mosques, um, in other civilian facilities. 
And then, by the way, if you then destroy Hamas, a campaign that is going to be exceedingly uh, difficult and where there will uh, over time be the emergence of a humanitarian uh, disaster, then what do you do? Um, in a much, much smaller scale, um, I remember during the fight to Baghdad when I was privileged to command the 101st Airborne Division, a two-star general, and I did two-star, three-star, and four-star tours in Iraq. Um, I remember we took the first major city, uh, liberated, seized the first major city uh, in Iraq. It was the, the holiest Shia city in uh, that exists, Najaf, a uh, very uh, important shrine there, the, the Gold Dome Mosque, uh, Imam Ali, uh, and... I remember calling my boss after a very tough several day fight. Uh, and I said, boss, I got good news and bad news. The good news is that we own Najaf. He asked, what's the bad news? I replied, we own Najaf. What do you want us to do with it? And so I'm sure, I'm confident, absolutely, given the professionalism, experience, expertise of the, both the prime minister and the members of his coalition and his military, that they are uh, discussing that particular subject, because at some point the commander of the, the forces in southern Israel is going to call up uh, Jerusalem and say, I've good news and bad news. Good news is we control Gaza. The bad news is we control Gaza. What do we do with it? And I don't think this time that to destroy Hamas, you just can't go a few miles in um, and then it reach a ceasefire. You can't negotiate with a group um, who is dedicated to your destruction. By the way, fighters who will blow themselves up to take you with them, who will rig entire buildings to blow up, rooms to blow up, improvise explosive devices, booby traps uh, all around there. You know, if they were as clever, in quotes, in the defense preparations as they were in the attacks that they conducted, this is going to be a very, very challenging campaign. And it's challenging to begin with. Uh, for the Israeli soldiers. There's a reason they've usually stopped after going, uh, again, a few miles into Gaza. But if the mission is to destroy Hamas, um, and that seems to be what the mission is, you've got to take the entire uh, area, and then you own it. Uh, and you've toppled with the government. Because keep in mind that Hamas is not just a terrorist organization, it also administers uh, this area. Uh, and it runs basic services and, and clinics and hospitals and schools and all the other components, essentially, uh, of supporting the society that is already one of the poorest in the world and now is going to be devastated further. Uh, and yet the people will not entirely support Hamas or entirely reject Hamas, even though they've brought on the people, the Palestinian people of Gaza what is going to be incredible tragedy, loss, suffering, deprivation, uh, many of them still will be with Hamas, even as substantial portions, yes, would just like them to go away and let them raise their kids and earn a living in peace. This is so hard for, I think, most American audiences to process because we all automatically try to figure out the why. It reminds me of, of a passage from your book where you were quoting Louise Richardson and her three R's, uh, the, the, the reasons that terrorists do what they do, revenge, renown, and reaction. Is that at the core of what's happening here? I know this is an unanswerable question, but Hamas had to know that if they did this, that there would be a massive retaliation coming they, and there they would be a massive loss of life. They may be wanting to, you know, have provided a catalyst for this. Although the strategic thinking of Hamas is, um, is not always entirely um, well thought through, uh, it, it, not all that well considered in many cases, but it may be that they welcome um, hope hoping in some way that this will lead to greater prominence of the uh, challenges of the Palestinian people, get the Arab world supportive of them again at a time when, of course, it was uh, anticipated that there was actually going to be an ag agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel, brokered by the U.S. to extend the Abraham Accords. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, it would have meant a, a, uh, an ironclad security commitment from the U.S., greater access to our weapon systems, uh, more swiftly, um, 
support for their pursuit of civilian uh, nuclear initiatives. Um, for for Israel, obviously, yet another state with with that would recognize them, with which they could conduct commerce, uh, and and Saudi Arabia would have likely insisted on certain provisions for the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank, in particular. So um, that is derailed. It's on hold uh, at best for now. It's hard to imagine when that might return, given that. Many Saudis are concerned about the plight of the Palestinian people. And and again, Prime Minister Netanyahu not only needs to, uh, I, I would suggest publicly, uh, paint a vision for what is about to happen. What is the mission that's been given to the military? Is it destroy? Is it defeat? Which is a, a slight bit less. Is it, what are they setting out to do? And then what will the vision be for the post-conflict phase uh, where it seems inescapable to me? There's no one to whom you can hand off. Uh, you're not going to get Fatah to come over back in again. You know, Fatah was essentially defeated by uh, Hamas a couple of years after the Israelis uh, left Gaza. So in the absence of any organization to which you can hand governance and control and restoration of basic services, repair of damaged facilities, all the rest of this, and that damage is going to be enormous. Um, you know, there may be a hope that there's some Arab countries or something like that, but I'm not sure that a lot of countries are going to raise their hand to take this on, given that there will still be some remnants uh, inside Gaza, others that may have gotten away or will get away, uh, that will come back and they're going to be terrorists, uh, as they have been. So the challenges are just enormous. Uh, and then I think that the prime minister needs to lay out some vision for the future for the Palestinians as well, because there will be those that will point out this because of their frustrations, their grievances, this and that, um, that some of this has resulted. This is no way excuses. I mean, this is absolutely uh, barbaric, unspeakable, uh, beyond unacceptable, horrific. Uh, and that is why there has to be this operation. Um, but again, there has to be very deep thinking, analysis, and planning for what happens the day after the guns fall silent. I hate to move on, but I want to make, I know we're running out of time, and I want to make sure that I at least get some of your thoughts on Ukraine with winter coming uh, and, and, and a kind of grinding stalemate in many ways. What what is your prognosis for that conflict? Well, having taught economics, um, I learned long ago that you should always answer a question like that with it depends. And it does depend. It depends on whether uh, U.S. support will continue once the five or six billion dollars that we have left in our uh, authorization and appropriation from Congress is expended. Uh, we've provided over $44 billion worth of arms, ammunition, and material. It's a staggering quantity. The U.S., I think, has led this effort very impressively, kept the alliance together, um, and and I think shown that the U.S. not just can but should lead uh, the world in these kinds of endeavors. I'm very strongly in favor of uh, providing all that we possibly can and accelerating decisions on some issues that have been on hold a bit, such as the longer range uh, missile for the multiple launch rocket system, which would have uh, cluster munitions in it and could aid Ukraine in particular in the one campaign in where they have had more success than I think is recognized, which is to uh, degrade the ability of the Russians to use Crimea as a logistics base, a headquarters, a naval base, uh, air bases, uh, they even hit the Black Sea Fleet headquarters during their command and staff uh, meeting and killed reportedly 20 or 30 of the staff officers uh, in attendance. As I mentioned, they've denied the use of the port of Sevastopol uh, in Crimea. The air bases are often under attack. So the ability of Russia to support by going from Russia proper across the Kerch Strait Bridge up through Crimea and then to support the Russian forces that are just up in southern Ukraine proper uh, they've degraded that somewhat. But keeping in mind that the goal, the objective of the summer offensive that now has turned into the fall offensive, it will continue in the winter. When I was there just four weeks ago, uh, the National Security Advisor, I was together with him on a panel at a conference, and he said, we will continue to fight through the winter. Uh, yes, 
It might slow down some of our activities. It might ground some of our uh, drones or aircraft. Uh, it might limit the cross-country mobility of our tanks and armored fighting vehicles, but our instruments are going to keep on going, and they, and they are. Uh, but it's still a question as to whether they'll achieve the objective of that ground operation, which is to ultimately degrade or cut the line of uh, communications, the logistical line that comes from Russia proper along the southeast and southern coast to the forces that are just north of Crimea. If they can cut that, then they could isolate those forces north of Crimea. You could really change the dynamics of this war and begin that all-important uh, component of this, make progress in it, which is convincing Putin that the war is unsustainable, not just on the battlefield, but also uh, in the Russian homeland because of the financial, economic, and personal sanctions and export controls, which we are now tightening and going after those who are evading those sanctions as well. So this is, again, as always, it takes a comprehensive approach. And so, again, the success of this will depend first and foremost on Congress authorizing additional uh, appropriations to support Ukraine, which I hope will be packaged very swiftly once there's a Speaker of the House together with support for Israel, southern border security, funding for FEMA because of the uh, natural disasters that we've seen and, and the emergency management agency is running out of money uh, and perhaps some other uh, ac actions as well. Um, so that's the first big issue. Will Europe continue? I think they will. Uh, they've already actually provided more now in terms of economic and humanitarian assistance and financial assistance. They've, we believe they've actually provided more now in aggregate uh, when it comes to uh, security assistance as well in pledges. And of course, we always talk in pledges as well. Um, so that's another component. Then, you know, what does transpire in Russia? Uh, Putin has never truly mobilized the entire country. Uh, the way that President Zelensky has, by the way, who has been a brilliant strategic leader. Think of his first big idea is, I don't want to ride, I want ammunition. Uh, I'm staying in Kiev. My family's staying in Kiev. We're going to defend Kiev, and all men will stay in Ukraine. That's pretty powerful. And then many others that have followed, and also a very uh, competent, experienced, uh, and inspirational uh, Army uh, military commander in chief, General Zeluzhny, with whom I spent over two hours during the last visit. Uh, but then he's communicated brilliantly to the world, truly Churchillian, if you will, uh, in that regard. Um, and then he's overseen the implementation of the big ideas. Think of his example rel relative to Putin. Putin sits in a suit at the end of a long table with, you know, the supplicants are down at the end. Uh, Zelensky is actually out on the battlefield, in Bakhmut, uh, in Kharkiv, in these other locations, sharing a degree of risk in, uh, with his soldiers uh, at the front, uh, how he spends his time, that j even just wearing the uniform, always some kind of olive drab um, uniform, whether it's a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, or what have you, just showing that his country uh, is at war, and then constantly refining the big ideas and doing it again and again and again. And the military had to adapt what they started out doing in the South. They hoped they could do combined arms operations. A lot of us hoped they would, but in the absence of air power, and we delayed the decision to provide Western aircraft too long, even to provide tanks for too long. Uh, so they didn't have all the wherewithal that they could have used. So they, instead of being able to penetrate these very substantial defenses, miles deep minefields, I, I can't recall anything like this um, it's really World War I uh, kind of circumstances. Uh, they had to just rely on infantrymen, and they're fighting from tree line to tree line, house to house, building to building, gaining maybe 100, 150 meters a day, occasionally a bit further, sometimes less, some setbacks. Uh, and the question is, will the Russians then also, could they crack at some moment. You know, they're not looking over their shoulder and seeing what they're fighting for, their country's survival, its independence. Um, they're looking over their shoulder at occupied areas that have citizens that hate them. Um, so these are the factors on which the future will depend uh, and the course of this particular conflict will depend. General, I could speak with you for another three hours if you'd let me, but I know we're running out of time. So I really want to congratulate you on your new book, Conflict. It's important. I think everyone should read it. And I also want to thank you for a lifetime of public service. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Well, it was a 
pleasure to be with you, and it was the greatest of privileges to serve. Thanks. If you'd like to learn more about one of the dominant themes my team and I are following, take a look at this video on reshoring, the return of manufacturing to the United States.